Welcome to Insight, today produced in partnership between Alaska Public Media and Oppenheim TV. We are chatting with Beth Nordland, Executive Director of the Anchorage Park Foundation, which facilitates park improvement projects, and Beth has generously agreed to share some of her experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Beth, for joining us today, and let's talk about parks. Thank you. The Anchorage Park Foundation is really the steward of this park network. Talk about the organization, its size, and the scope of its activities. Well, the Anchorage Park Foundation mobilizes public support for parks and trails in Anchorage. We're the nonprofit partner to the city parks and recreation department. The Anchorage Park Foundation is 11 years old, and we came into being because the citizens of Anchorage told the then mayor that um, it was time to have a place to invest private money mm -hmm. and encourage volunteer support in other ways. So that's what we do. We use um, all kinds of public monies, so federal, state, local, bonds, uh, and we put those together with private dollars and materials and, and um, unique pockets of funding, and we build projects together. The great bulk of our projects are volunteer identified as mm -hmm. community needs. We've been doing challenge grants since 2006, funded by our great funder, the Rasmussen Foundation. It is unique in that uh, volunteers get to count their hours as contributions to their challenge grant, but uh, grantees need to match dollar for dollar the challenge. We give up to $40,000 per park improvement. We have an interesting and unique program, which is the report card that we use. So we have volunteers go out into their parks and analyze the assets that they have there, uh, which you'd be surprised at the results. A lot of people go out in the park that they love so much that it's part of their daily life. Uh, but, you know, you can, you can critique a park with love and um, give it a fix-it list that is quite a long list of things that need to get done. We use our community identified fix-it lists to raise the money we need to do the projects. And uh, there's nothing more rewarding than going to a community group, talking to them about um, how they can do report cards mm -hmm. and have someone from the back of the room say, I filled one of those out two years ago and we now have a beautiful park that got an A this year. <laughs> so um, you can really see um, the community involvement shine, but people like to identify the projects themselves. Seven years ago, some mothers of children that have some disabilities came to the Park Foundation and said, uh, can you tell us where the accessible playgrounds are? And we said, wow, we don't have any, and there aren't any in Alaska. So we got to work, um, and we built the first accessible playground for kids of all abilities. But in Anchorage, I'm proud to say we've built six inclusive playgrounds to date, and we have five under construction this summer. You have a, a neighborhood parks improvement uh, program. Uh, talk about that and how you define projects for that program. When we are looking at the needs of a neighborhood park, we go to the neighbors, we ask them to assess the condition of their neighborhood park, um, we identify a fix-it list that we think we can tackle and raise some money for. We have had wild success with this program, especially with our state funder, the Alaska State Legislature, mm -hmm. um, because legislators tend to see uh, bringing home, home resources to their own neighborhood as a great way to make a neighborhood happy for a relatively small investment. So there's a little funds. bit of a political hook in, in in this. It's not in terms of politics, but in terms of understanding how people function in society. That you have voters who are voting for a person to hold office 
and you become a way in which they can demonstrate that they are fulfilling that responsibility. Yes, meeting the needs of neighbors. Meeting, meeting the needs of neighbors. Let's talk about some of the other programs. You also have a program that, that I believe uh, you uh, founded, uh, which is the Youth Employment in the Parks uh, program. Talk about that. We employ teens ages 16 to 19 in the summers here in Anchorage. Um, they do a lot of work building trails, mm -hmm. um, taking care of our waterways, our habitat, you know, planting trees, um, doing the kind of stewardship that it takes to take care of our public lands. And um, that's what we're doing is we're creating stewards with the Youth Employment and Parks And this program. is very often the first job that, th that this, these youth uh, uh, have. So you're also helping them to understand the requirements of, of joining the workforce. Right, we, <clears throat> we often get about 220 applicants we interview all teens that are eligible, so we'll end up doing 150 interviews. And by the way, we engage our community partners in helping us do those interviews because mm -hmm. they're really fun and that creates ownership in the program. Um, and then we, we're only able to hire 21 crew members, so... Uh, it's very competitive. It's very competitive, but it's a first job we're not relying on past experiences. We're not relying on your grades. Um, and it does turn out that Youth Employment and Parks is a very diverse program. Uh, Anchorage has 97 languages spoken in our school district, and you'll often hear many of them um, by the teens in our program. We're very proud of the diversity. We're proud of the work they really accomplish. Um, but we also have an education component to the program, and we do recreation. Hopefully that's relevant to the work that they did. So if they build a mountain bike trail, we'll rent mountain bikes and um, allow Everybody them to try to... it out. Yeah, so they're experimenting with different recreation opportunities in Anchorage and um, learning a lot more about parks and public lands. Um, and then at the end of the program, we actually have a mentorship week, mm -hmm. which includes some job shadowing in fields that they're interested in. And um, we usually do some panels. They can learn about other volunteer opportunities or maybe the Peace Corps or, of course, moving on to um, college. And, the other, and we also have a, a financial literacy program that we do every payday, basically. Wells Fargo comes out on site and um, gives them a lesson on a lesson for payday that that week. Um, it might be about college saving, might be about just getting a checkbook. So, if you were to take a look at the dozen years, because the organization has been in existence for a dozen years, you were the first employee hired in 2004, and now we're talking in 2016. Um, those dozen years, how has the park been, how, how has the park system been transformed and what is next for the Anchorage Park Foundation? We have improved 157 parks and trails in 157 Anchorage. out of 250? 250, 223, 223 parks. parks. Yes, we have covered a lot of ground in Anchorage. Um, but as you know, we have a lot of acreage to take care of. Right. And I would allege that a park system is only vibrant when its community is engaged. So um, we haven't seen any let up in challenge grant applications. There's been no you know, downturn in the number of calls we receive for assistance. Um, you know, with a four-person staff, we are always hopping, and we only deal with parks and trails. So, um, you know, there's just no limit to the amount of work that we can accomplish with the community of Anchorage. And with the budget being so impacted over the next years, the significance of the, uh, of the foundation can only increase to the, uh, as regards to the health of, of the park system around Anchorage. Yes, we know that um, Anchorage Parks and Trails make Anchorage a great place to live, work, and play. 
We've been partnering with the business community directly through the Anchorage Economic Development Corporation with our Trails Initiative. Um, of course, we've got a great government relations strategy. Um, we've been working tightly with our state and our municipal government is our landlord. So it's always nice to have a friendly mayor that we can work with. So let's talk about your, your, your Trails Initiative. So we've been working with the business community to attract contributions um, of volunteer and cash nature um, to our beautiful system of trails, um, which are clearly the jewel of our system and so well loved by the public. 66% um, of Anchorage say that they want to be using the trails more. And of course we have 250 miles of it, so um, plenty to take care of and plenty to do. We've been so successful with engaging neighborhoods and volunteer projects and things that they can achieve in their own neighborhood parks that we've been, I, I've created a new word <laughs> and it's called neighborhoodizing the trails. And we're looking to attract that kind of neighborhood support to our trail system. So we're trying to build affinity for our entire system of trails but then also have people have ownership um, on a local basis on a very like a hyper local basis right right where they live um, I would compare it to a metro system mm -hmm. and say you know you know where you're um, where you get on and where you get off every day and what you have affinity for and um, yeah we're, we're trying to build community through our trail system and they're so well loved. I think we can do it. How are businesses stepping up to um, to participate in that program? Well, we're just getting to the point that businesses can do something useful for this program. Um, we've been having uh, people volunteer. Um, we've, we're creating a new wayfinding system, so there'll a, be signs. Do you signs. have an adopt a trail kind of a? We kind have of an a... adopt a trail program, but we need to to work on this is kind of a frontier for us. Mm -hmm. um, but with our signs now and our little neighborhood icons that can attract you to uh, your neighborhood ownership of the piece of trail that you love the most, um, there'll be products and, and signs that people can invest in uh, concretely. So they they'll, will be able to have people give cash. Um, but we are all about volunteer volunteers, so it's going to be interesting. And I'd say um, keep an eye on us because we're neighborhoodizing our trails. Beth Nordland, thank you so much for sharing the work of the Anchorage Parks Foundation, and thank you so much for your insight. Thank you. Welcome to Insight, today produced in partnership between Alaska Public Media and M. Oppenheim TV. Today we are chatting with Polly Carr, Executive Director at the Alaska Center for the Environment and the Executive Director at Alaska Conservation Voters. Polly has generously agreed to share some of her experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Polly, for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. So these two organizations are fascinating. They're two sides of, of a single coin. It is about conservation. On the one hand, you have an organization, a C4, that is allowed to engage in certain advocacy activities. That's the Alaska Conservation Voters. And on the other hand, you have an education organization that really focuses on bringing a sensibility in the community surrounding conservation, and that's the Alaska Center for the Environment. Talk about these two organizations and how they advance conservation across the state of Alaska. Sure. Well, I am, as you said, the executive director of, of two organizations, um, but they share um, the similar vision. And so our vision is that we have an Alaska that is sustained by robust fisheries, a healthy climate, and our clean energy sources, and also an Alaska that is shaped by an active and engaged citizenry, which means people have a voice in the decisions impacting their environment and communities and use that voice to hold decision makers accountable. I would say that um, in addition to, you know, of course, working 
for things and providing an alternative vision for our state, yes, we have to always work on protecting the resources that make those communities sustainable. And so we do work um, to protect salmon and salmon habitat, for example, against extractive, short-sighted coal mining. We don't engage in every uh, in extractive industry. We don't believe that as an organization we should spread ourselves across every industry in the state, but we do work to ensure that what we see as the more sustainable industries like our fishing industries and the resources that really support our communities are um, protected and prioritized over what we really see as short-sighted, outside-driven extractive industries. The collective work of the two organizations can really be boiled down into four areas. We educate. We educate children. We expose young people to the outdoors. Um, we cultivate future leaders, including high school students who are learning how to be advocates. We advocate, we work with everyday Alaskans around the state to speak up for issues that they care about, and we elect leaders who will champion those issues, and we hold them accountable. And we, we work in all of those areas because we truly believe that you have to have an informed uh, Alaskan uh, population who can engage on these decisions, and it's not enough for us to be educated. It's not enough for us to push for policies that will protect uh, the resources that we care about in our communities. We have to have leaders in, excuse me, we have to have leaders in place who can ensure that those decisions endure. So we, we educate, we cultivate, so that is about skills and about the ability to execute. We advocate and we elect. Mm -hmm. And so you, you have these programs that are, that are surrounding these different areas. Mm -hmm. And the sensibility that, that guides what you're doing is Alaska is here for every Alaskan. Mm -hmm. And everybody's concern needs to be uh, taken into account. Do you see yourself as an organization that is working uh, for some things and against other things? It's such a great question because I think that historically um, anyone working in conservation advocacy um, is seen as, you know, it's seen as the no movement and right. we are working really hard to change that. So I would say that yes, we are working for sustainable economies. We are working for having people stay in their communities and be able to live off the renewable resources that can support their communities for years to come. You talk about cultivating future leaders. Describe how you go about cultivating these leaders in a way that also connects to your advocacy work. Great. Um, we have a program uh, for high school students called the Alaska Youth for Environmental Action Program. And this is an org a program that was founded in 1998. I actually was a part of its founding with the teenagers back then. And um, through this program, we provide leadership training, civic engagement skills, um, and uh, action project planning to um, young people from villages and cities all over the state each year. Uh, and through that training, teens then choose issues that they want to advocate on that are impacting their communities. And they will often choose a, a statewide campaign that they can come together around. Right now it's climate change and trying to get leaders to look at strategies to um, support more renewables and reduce emissions. One other element of that program that's so critical in this day and age is that it also really teaches di diplomacy skills. We have young people from urban and rural communities from really different cultures that come together through that program and they learn to appreciate uh, different perspectives on an issue. Right. They um, go down to the state capitol each year and they meet with their decision makers so they learn how to hold you know, professional meetings and have civil discourse, which is, I think is something that's lacking, um, as we know, across our nation. And so it really is about building these holistic leaders. And 
whether they continue on in the conservation movement or whether they go into some other field, they've got that skill set and they're going to be effective advocates into the future. It's a very good point that people who um, have skills and knowledge that attach to the environment, uh, people who understand how, for example, uh, for example, salmon fisheries work and that cycle of life, mm -hmm. do not always have the skills to walk into a legislature and make a presentation on the thing that they know yes. and be effective as advocates. And what you're doing is you're connecting the dots between those skills that, that people might have in the field and the ability to communicate that knowledge to others who are in a position to act on it. Yes, very much so. And these young people, um, they have authentic stories. They have incredible credibility because they're speaking about things in their communities. And so being able to help them strengthen their skills and how they communicate those issues and how they do it in a way that um, is not polarizing is really important uh, to the future of this work. What is the size of the organization? What's your budget? Mm -hmm. What is your headcount? How many people work for you? Great. Um, our budget is roughly, uh, for, the, for the C3, mm -hmm. <laughs> is roughly um, one and a half million. Mm -hmm. And our budget for the C4 um, is roughly uh, a few hundred thousand dollars, which fluctuates uh, annually with um, different election cycles. Um, Within that budget, um, a large portion is generated from our uh, revenue through our outdoor education camp, Trailside Discovery Camp. Trailside Discovery Camp, wonderful camp. Um, this is really the, one of the foundations of our, of our work. Um, Trailside Discovery Camp educates young people ages four to 18, exposing them to the outdoors and the natural environment, invoking a sense of appreciation and inspiration um, providing these hands-on experiences where kids are like out mucking up in the streams and you know seeing salmon right in their backyards and developing some leadership and stewardship skills. Um, approximately 5,000 to 9,000 children each year go through those camps um, and for many young people um, who might not otherwise have exposure to the outdoors or who's you know, families don't go camping every weekend. This is a first time experience for them. And so it's fairly profound. Who are your partners? So we work with groups like the Renewable Energy Alaska Project. Um, we work, uh, we're in communication with um, some of the utilities. Um, and, you know, mostly we're looking, we're working with um, uh, people and then government leaders who might be interested in pursuing some of these policies. For example, the Anchorage administration. So if you were to uh, sketch some of the other changes that you'd like to bring to the organization over the next three to five years, what yeah. would those be? Well, um, you know, we, we started this conversation talking about the two organizations, and one of the areas that we think that we can grow and really strengthen in Alaska is building up that um, advocacy to get more leaders um, into office that will be able to support these issues. Um, and so we will be looking to grow that presence um, in the state uh, because we believe that there are so many Alaskans out there that you know care about these issues and want to see their communities sustainable. They want clean water. They want their salmon prioritized over short-sighted development. Right. Um, they want you know, jobs for their children that are in their communities. And so we need more people like that to be speaking up and we need to get more of these leaders in place and to hold more of these leaders accountable. And we're also gonna be looking at um, you know, bringing the work that we do among these two organizations um, closer in alignment in terms of our advocacy and our elections work, um, really kind of bringing that under a, a more unified identity going forward. So there will be a, a, a branding exercise that you will be pursuing to be part of your communication process so that you have a rational message that people really can understand and grasp and, and act upon. Correct. And you know, one of the elements of um, this work to get more people engaged and to build more uh, power for conservation is um, an increasing focus by us to 
reduce barriers to civic engagement. Um, one of the campaigns that we're working on right now with an incredibly diverse coalition around the state is this notion of automatic voter registration, uh, which will be either on the August ballot or the November general election. And we are engaged in that uh, because we think that the more people who can vote, the better, right. uh, you know, and that is one of our primary... Uh, Democracy, what a concept. Yeah, it's one of our primary focuses. You know, I said we, we not only have an Alaska sustained by these natural resources, but we have an Alaska that's sustained by people being engaged, and we need to break down every barrier we can so that more people can have a voice and a choice and the decisions impacting their communities and resources. So we're going to be engaged in that effort and then probably additional efforts over the next several years to make it more possible for more Alaskans to be a part of that democracy. Well, Polly Carr, thank you so much for describing the work of your two organizations, um, the Alaska Center for the Environment and, the, and Alaska Conservation Voters. Thank you so much for your work on behalf of um, Alaska and, and the Alaskan environment. And thank you so much for your insights. Thank you.